Wow, the audio is terrible. The buildings, the our drop ceiling is creaking like crazy because it's windy today. I don't know if I can stand that all morning. <laughs> See if the wind dies down, but if it doesn't, I'd almost be better off just doing a, a QA session or something for my car, and just chatting with you guys.
Yeah, that's pretty terrible. Um, we are doing Leica R's today. Or at least we might be. If that noise doesn't stop, then maybe not. Good set here. Let's see. Twenty-four, thirty-five, fifty, fifty, eighty-five. So fifty. One of them's an F two Summicron. The other one's an F one four Summilux. being the 24, is it this guy? Yeah. This focus is not great. Pretty heavy. Uh, but it's consistent, which is nice. Good evening, Max. anything I can do for audio to like isolate that sound. Sam, hey Matt, I finished Sunny Vising my Nikkor AI set, but the one thing I didn't pay money for was the seamless focus curing. I ended up using 360 degree seamless rubber ones. Those rubber ones can be okay. You definitely save money, and they work well enough for most situations. My question is how snug, how snug the 3D printed ones are and how easy they come on and off. The rubber ones are fine, but it's easy for them to move along the barrel. Uh, I, personally, I think 3D printed gears are terrible. Uh, there's no way to properly fit them to the lens. Um, they're not going to be much better than the rubber ones, honestly. The 3D printed ones completely depend on how they're designed and how they're printed, what material they're printed with. Um, there's no way to say that all 3D printed gears are good or bad or whatever, but in general, 
they're never gonna hold as well as something like what we use, which is solid black Delrin. This is the most reliable way to put a gear on a lens. Yeah, this is definitely not 3D printed. These are CNC machined from solid Delrin. Good afternoon, I have a couple of Nikkor AIS, but I'm considering a Nikon non-AI set. Do you see issues around those? Um, when you say non-AI, if you're referring to the, like the pre-AI, you can have issues with mounting because they have a larger, uh, a larger lip around the iris ring that sort of encompasses the mount. Um, and some mounts just won't work on those, like the Litax or the ones that we make, they're basically the same thing. So you have to be careful with adapters on those. But as far as the other parts of the mod, de-clicking, the focus gear, they'll work great, no problem. I don't know why there's no mount for this one. Maybe I'll just steal it from another one. Haha, there we go. Yeah, I don't have a Nikon here right now in front of me, but um, pretty much every modern Nikon lens going back to the AIS, <coughs> they have two tabs on the iris ring that are uh, protruding past the mount. And those two tabs communicate with the camera. There's another tab that corresponds on the camera body. And that's how it reads the position of the iris. And those tabs are fine. They clear all the mounts, no problem. The pre-AI stuff that has that larger iris ring um, with that lip that sticks up past the mount will be an issue if you're trying to adapt them. This is in really good shape aside from the heavy focus. Uh, I say it's heavy, but it's consistent, which makes it okay to me. And it's fluid, it's not dry or it's not um, it's not lumpy or sticky. It's a nice consistent heavy. So I think that's okay. Iris feels fine, it's you know, loose, whatever. Um no brassing on the mount, all of the internals here, it's a ROM system, so it's not a cam. Um, and these all of these internals look good. Anodizing looks good, engravings look good. Did a little bit of wear and tear on the on the grip, on the anodizing. Nothing major. Um, something that does stick out a little bit. These um, sunshade pins look sharper than usual, um, and this engraving looks larger than usual. So I think this is just a, a much later copy. In fact, let's look up the serial number, 4056. Twenty-four, twenty-eight. What is this? 
24-28. Ill merit. And the last one. Oh yeah. Yeah, this is definitely the the latest copy. So this was produced between 1997 and 2004-ish. My notes seem to be inaccurate as far as the filter thread goes. Uh, nine elements in seven groups, F2.8. ROM, that's correct. Ah, filter threads. My notes say series eight, but this is very clearly E60. Let's try that. This is a 60 millimeter, yes. Yeah, that is not Series 8. So let's update that. Updated change log to 2021. And I need the diameter. Say 420 grams. That's way off. Three sixty one. Oh, I also don't have a spec for the iris blades. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's up to date. Oh, thank you, Max. I always forget that. Uh, where did I put that? Okay, current lens. Like, uh, ta-da, 24 millimeter. Paul says, Hi Matt, I recently completed my Leica R set here in the UK. Finally found my 19mm version 1. I'm curious to know how to get it get it to an 80mm OD front. Is it a step down ring of some kind? Yes. The 19mm version 1 has an 82mm filter thread. So you have to use a step down ring and it will vignette on full frame. Hello, Mr. Rajput. Um yeah, there's no way around that. It's it's gonna be a step down ring, unfortunately. The alternative is the 19 millimeter version two, uh, which does use a step up ring. And the the current ring that we make is actually also gonna cause vignetting. So we have a second, we have a revised version that we're machining probably next week. I think it goes into production because uh, we finally had one here to test. So everything checked out, everything looked good. Okay. Got all those bits. Did my housekeeping, so that's good.
I cannot wait for this wind to stop. Our building isn't exactly old, but all of the all of the non-warehouse space is a drop ceiling, and the beams that support that drop ceiling are just creaky and noisy and obnoxious. Like that. Daniel finally caught a stream while it is happening. You did. Welcome aboard. Which now has double meaning because we. It sounds like we're on a ship with all this creaking. <laughs> so, welcome to our creaky ship. The SS Cinemod. Side, so I can peek at the trees and kind of see how windy it is. Okay, so this all looks original, which bodes well. Um, it looks like it has not been serviced or re-greased with the inappropriate grease, so I'm happy about that. Michael, I have a full set of these modded by you. Sometimes the aperture drifts while shooting. Is there something I can adjust? I've been putting tape on them, which is a drag. Um, there's nothing you can adjust externally. If you wanted to dig into them, you can. But um, it's worth noting that if we did the work, then we will correct it, no charge. So if you want to send them in to get adjusted, go for it. like that. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing with Leica R's, is they will do that unless precautions are taken during the mod, um, which we do, but even over time, because they weren't designed to function that way, um, it can sort of creep back in. So, yeah, definitely get them back to us if you have that opportunity and we'll take care of them. I take it back. I think this does not look original. That is not like his usual grease. Somebody put some other grease in there. percent way to stop the the, um, the iris from drifting 
over a long enough period of time, but there are correct ways to perform the declicking process where it reduces that time period significantly. I've heard that the 24 millimeter is not as desirable as the other wides. Is being a Minolta design the issue or is it the glass? Uh, couldn't tell you. I think it's preference. I don't know why anybody wouldn't want this lens. Uh, I, I hope it's not the fact that there's a third party design involved because if that's the case, then people are in for a surprise. Pretty much all these lenses are incestuous and designs got kicked around and manufactured by third parties and designed by third parties. It's nothing, it's nothing special. If, if people knew who and where Leica lenses were actually being made, they probably wouldn't have such a, a strong preference towards the Made in Germany moniker. I guess for the wides, personally, I the, the set that I used to own had a 19mm version 2, and then it jumped to the 28 version 2, and I don't think I ever had a 24 in my set. Not because I didn't like it, I just really enjoyed the 28, and that was wide enough for me before jumping all the way to 19. and 28 all my by you all yay thanks for the craftsmanship thank you for giving us the opportunity says what are the main things to look out for when buying and use like a R. Um, I'll, I'll go through some of them as I do this set, but I think one of the biggest things is just the obvious stuff. Um, just look through the glass, run the focus, run the iris, make sure nothing is sticky or uneven or loose. Um, uh, a, a lens can be serviced and most of that can be revitalized. But one of the biggest telltale signs that you can't really correct is the brassing on the mount that will tell you basically how much the lens was taken on and off a camera. 
Um, this is a bad example because this has no brass in it, but I'm sure that some of these will. Don't bother looking at serial numbers, it's a waste of time. Um, to elaborate on the serial number thing, I'm sure that most of the, the usuals here are used to me saying it. Um, but the, you know, I can have this 24 is a good example. This is the the most recent version of this lens that they made. So there were three different versions, ranging all the way from, let's see, the 24 millimeter f2.8. Where is it? There it is, 24 millimeter. There are three versions ranging from 1974 to 2004. Um, so let's use this as an example. Let's say you find a really early serial number. Let's, uh, you know, it was produced in 1977, we'll say. And it sat in a box in some dentist's uh, office, you know, never touched, never came out of the box, maybe he used it once or twice. That lens is probably going to be in really good shape. Then let's say you have this one that was produced in, say, 1990. That's a difference of 20 some odd years. And yet this brand new or this much newer one that photographer could have abused it. He could have been a photojournalist and thrown it in his bag and took it to the desert and filled it with sand and cleaned it with his t-shirt. The serial number just tells you when it was made. It doesn't tell you how it was cared for. Um, it also doesn't help at all for matching the quality of the lenses. Everybody thinks that if you get the serial numbers close enough, then the look will be the same across the lenses. That's also a, a myth for several reasons. Uh, most of all, because of what I just said. You could have two lenses, let's say a 24 and a 35, that were produced within days of each other. One of them was cared for really well, and the other one wasn't cared for at all. They're going to give completely different results. And then similarly, you could have that 24 and that 35, the 24 being a Minolta design that was actually manufactured in Canada or Japan even, and then the 35 that was made in Germany, different materials, different glass, different factory, everything. So don't put too much weight into the serial numbers because they don't necessarily help determine the quality or the character of a lens. And also don't believe in the uh, Canada versus Germany. Just because some Leica R's were made in Canada and some were made in Germany doesn't mean that one is better or worse than the other. So don't be afraid to mix those versions. Yeah, people do obsess about the serial numbers, and it's just a waste of time. How then do you find a color match set? If you're looking for a color match set, the only way to do that is trial and error. You have to buy a bunch of them, and you have to do your own tests, shoot a gray card, can, uh, examine that actual color cast, and decide from there. Uh, aside from that, there's no way to know. There is absolutely nothing saying that a lens that's been sitting on a shelf for up to 40 years is going to match copy to copy with another lens. Uh, it's just not realistic. It's not possible to expect that out of a lens that old.
This is still a little bit gritty, and I think it's inside the bearings, unfortunately. This one might need to get set aside for a little bit more of a, a deep cleaning, which I'm not going to do on the stream because that revol involves taking it over to the tank. I don't want to sit you guys here for 30 minutes while I walk away from the camera. Well, or call Mark M. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> Uh, I'm not gonna lie, that's uh... Oh, it's upside down. That's who this set is going to, so... I get that question all the time. People ask, do you guys sell like a ours? Do you sell sets? Do you sell individuals? 99% um, of the time I say, call Mark Magnarella. He's the guy. He's the one that's hunting them. He's the one that finds these things all over the world. Um, he is basically a Leica R hunter. Alright, this does not... I know you can't hear it because of the ceiling, but maybe you can. It's way too scratchy. I don't like that. That's not good enough for, for a Leica R. So... This one is going to get set aside. keeps up like this. Um, what was his last name again? Magnarella. Um, he, it's, he's kind of like that guy that you find in an alley that, you know, he knows what he's doing, but he doesn't have an actual business. He doesn't have a website. He doesn't have, um, I, I think the most common place to find him is on Red User. Um, I don't know how people find his stuff for sale. Uh, try Red User and just look for Mark Magnarella. Here, I'll, I'll write it out here. That's how you spell his name. Wow, oh, is that where he puts stuff? eBay, okay. Silver Fancy. I had no idea. <laughs> Honestly, I... <laughs> But we get tons of people that buy stuff from him and they say, hey, I got your stuff, and, or I bought a lens from Mark. So he's a, a, a great resource and um, he's, he's, a, he's an honest guy. So uh, if he says this lens is in good condition and it's been serviced and uh, you know free of fungus, free of this and that, then it's pretty reliable. All right, so all those parts go there. I might, uh, I'm probably gonna postpone this mod stream. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow or during the week. Um, but this, I can't deal with this, this noise. I don't know if it's picking up on the microphone the way it is here in person, but it's like listening to a Geiger counter go off constantly. <laughs> I don't know, can you guys hear it? Is that picking up? It must be because I can see it in the audio level every time it goes. All right, 
maybe what I'll do is just go over these lenses and show you guys all the different bits that I see. Optical Brilliance, that's his company, yes. That sounds familiar. Hey, this is the first live stream I've been able to catch live. You guys are doing some really cool stuff and I'm looking forward to purchasing stuff from you in the future. Thank you, Patrick. I apologize that this is your first uh, mod stream. It's usually nice and quiet and relaxing where I can actually focus on my work, no pun intended. Um, so I think what I'll do then is just go over this set and show you guys all the different conditions, but I'm not gonna pop them open because this is insane. And I wanna make sure that this 24 gets properly serviced. Good morning, Johnny. So whoever was asking about the mount, was that, or about the uh, condition, this is another bad example because it looks great, but there's no brassing on this. If you look at the the condition, it's just all silver. There's no gold coloring to it. Um, but other than that, this this lens is in absolutely fantastic condition. The rubber is still nice and soft and pliable. The engraving paint is flawless, and this is factory. This is not. Um, this is not like a restoration job. So this lens is in, I would say, mint condition. And I don't use the term mint lightly. The optics are perfectly clean. There is not a single ding or dent. Um, the anodizing is flawless. No signs of wear. I mean, this, this spec right here is the most I can find. I don't think that'll even show up on camera. There it is, you can see it there. That speck in the anodizing is the worst flaw that I can see on this lens, cosmetically. And the focus feels brilliant, which on this particular lens is actually kind of tricky um, because this glass is pretty heavy. The actual focus group that it has to push back and forth is pretty heavy. So, um, the blades look fantastic, everything about this. Um, usually if it's been disassembled, actually, well, no, they, they do look good. Usually these screws for the light baffle will be um, chewed up a little bit and they're not touched at all. They're completely black. The only other thing that I see is some very minor scuffing on the paint around this rear housing. But even then, it's it's so minor, it, nobody would notice that. So this is a beauty. Let's see, what else do we have here? We have a 50... I think this is the F2. Yeah, F2. Again, fantastic condition. See all of this, all of this anodizing and paint here, flawless. No scuffing, no marks, nothing. Which lens was that? That was a 35 Sumalux. This is a 50 Sumacron. Beautiful condition. Very similar to that one. There's no rubber on this one. This is just metal and the grip. Again, no scuffs, no dings. Tiny, tiny little speck in the anodizing. Oddly enough, in almost the same spot as the other one. Um, but yeah, all of this paint is original for the engravings. It's slightly yellowed, but far from bad. Focus feels beautiful on this one. This is equally as nice as that 3514. And then a 50 Lux. Let's check this guy out. Yeah. <laughs> 
Again, absolutely no brassing. There's a little bit of wear on this um, this protective shield. And just tiny, tiny bits of dust or um, you know, dirt and lint and whatnot in the focus grip. Oh, this one has a uh, what is that? It's got a little bump in the focus. I think it's just lost motion. I think it's a little loose. The glass looks fantastic. a little bit on the front element, but internally it looks fantastic. I just bought my first Leica R after ages and the experience put me off. The lens had something loose inside and quite a lot of haze, so I returned it. So much effort involved. Yeah. That's the other question that people ask every time we're doing these mod streams is, uh, you know, where do I find this stuff? And obviously everybody looks on eBay. Um, but if you buy from reputable sellers, that experience will be a lot better. Um, try websites like keh.com or tamarkin.com. That's, that's their main business. Buying on eBay, you're... You're gonna find people that are just flipping lenses or they're selling off the stuff that they don't want and there's usually a reason they don't want it. Actually, what I should be doing, since you guys are all here, let's, I, one of these days I'm going to release my Leica R database, which is, uh, probably the most complete database of Leica R's, I think. I don't know of anyone else that's doing one to the degree that we are. Um, but let's take a step back here. So this 3514, what number is this? 3727. So this is from 1996 onward. I don't know when they stopped making these. I'd have to look through my catalogs. You mentioned third-party manufacturers and Leica. Do you know anything about the Ingenue Leica Zoom? Yes, I do. When you break lenses down and clean internal optics, what's the safest combination of materials slash solutions to use? Also, how do you mitigate dust and other small particles left behind after cleaning? Um, fantastic questions. The chemicals completely depend on the, the materials that we're cleaning and what we're trying to clean off. If it's fingerprints or grease type, you know, oily type residues, we use a very specific chemical. It's actually this one that's almost always right next to me. Um, I can't really share what this is because it's not legal in most states. Um, or at least it's not available, uh, but it's pretty safe to use something like acetone or methanol. However, if you're talking about internal optics, you always have to be careful of edge paint. If you use acetone or methanol and you wipe an element that has a, any sort of paint around it or near it, or plastic for that matter, you're either going to wipe off the paint or you're going to melt the plastic. So be very careful. Uh, as far as mitigating dust, our building is a giant filter. We have three separate industrial um, filters for the whole building, and then the service department specifically has additional filters. Um, we've, we've got, I mean, 
ton, there's so many things that we do to, to reduce dust as much as possible. Uh, humidity is a, a great tool. Everyone always thinks, oh, you have to have the driest possible environment, but no, you actually want to have some humidity because that combats static electricity. So there's a lot of little things that we do. Um, the wipes that we use are all Kimtech Kim wipes, so they're very low lint. Tons of stuff. I mean, I, I could go on all day. Our air hoses are ionized uh, and filtered completely redundantly over and over. So, yeah, there's tons of stuff. Um, what was the other one? Oh, Patrick, I've been selling a few things on eBay. I just feel bad about having good equipment on my shelves. I'd rather see it out in the field. Yeah, I mean, that's a good example of a, a, a good seller, but most of the time, I imagine, people are just, especially with lenses and the prices and stuff that we've been seeing on, like, FDs and, and uh, Olympus OM and stuff like that, uh, people are just flipping glass, even if it's in terrible condition. They'll find some shoddy lens tech and they'll say, hey, do just what's needed to make it look good. Yeah. Uh, I picked up a 50 Lux E60 a couple of days ago, still waiting in the mail for it to arrive. 1100. Hopefully it's Lucky Barn Vine and not scuffed. Good luck. Let us know how that goes next weekend. Oh, hey, Phil. Best ionized lens hoses in the lens business. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Yeah, Phil's seen our shop. He's seen all the... Uh, you know, there's just so many little things that a lens shop or a lens technician needs to, to do their job well. We have a laminar flow bench that filters air when we're doing really large optics. Um, there's just so many little things that we do. Anyways, where was I? So my database, which I will release soon. Um, I've just been scouring all of my, um, what are they, catalogs. Have you got a chance to watch Eyes Wide Shut yet? Oh, I've seen it many times. I did not watch it since last weekend, though, or the weekend before. I did not see the other one. Oh, not yet. Uh, I started using that app, though, that website, uh, Letterboxd, and I've been sharing that with my wife and trying to find stuff. Would love to see a tour of your offices. I might do that uh, when nobody's here. There's probably half a dozen technicians in the back right now. Or in, I say back, but it's just behind me. Uh, I would definitely have to clean up first. <laughs> and when I say clean up, I mean like hide sensitive documents and sensitive um, projects. Obviously, the workspace itself is extremely clean. Like you can eat off the floor kind of clean. Um, but yeah, there's always delicate, sensitive materials. I would want to hide all of that. So it's definitely not going to be a like right now kind of thing. Um, I would hate to break a bunch of NDAs by giving a, a harmless tour. Anyways, so this guy, 3514, latest model. What is this? 3727. Okay, so this would be 1996 onward. I do not have the optical design. I don't think I have a manual that late either. Ta da! What is this? 99. There we go. 98. That's perfect. Five one four Summa Lux R. Here we go. So ten nine. Wow. Okay. Ten elements in nine groups. 
awesome. Point five. I hate that this is in metric. And this says E67, is that correct? It is great. Okay, weight in grams, that never matches. So let's try it. Whoops, uh, 690 grams. Six seventy two. Close enough. My latest my last record was six seventy eight. That might have been with a cap, so change log. Two twenty twenty one. Headed Yahweh. Excellent, Johnny. Matthew tested some like R in a local rental house and the lenses were declicked, but the aperture was slowly closing by itself. What is causing that problem? Wrong lub. lube. Um, no, not the wrong lube. It has nothing to do with the lube. It has to do with how the lens was declicked. So ask that rental house where they got the work done and then ask them to send it back to be adjusted. Um, it's inevitable the aperture will loosen up over time, but depending on how it was declicked, that can be mitigated or can be prevented for much longer periods of time. Also, any thoughts on the moiré in relation to glass speed and sharpness, or is it something solely based on the sensor? Moiré is completely a sensor phenomenon or flaw. It's it's strictly when you take a uh, an analog image and break it into a pattern, like a, a Bayer sensor, you know, pixelated, essentially. Do you mod one touch push pull still zoom so they can be racked instead? I do not. You know, 35 to 70. I have one here, but it's not the push pull. This is the 35 to 70 two or F4. Sorry. Um, this one has issues of its own. Actually, it looks like somebody solved it with these step up rings. So the issue with this lens. For modding, which I need to design um, a specific step up ring for this lens, but the filter threads are right here, and when you go to infinity, they retract below this front housing, so you can't put uh, a, a standard front ring on it. You have to use filter th punched out filters or step up rings like this. So I'm probably just going to design a a um, a dedicated front ring. By the way, your Lens Geek shirt Super Speed got a bigger size is coming in a 3XL with a pick one. Uh I don't think we made 3XL. We definitely have 2XL coming. That shirt sold way better than I expected. So we do have more coming. Um I can definitely get a 3XL on order. In fact, let me write a note here. I will do that for you, Johnny. We do it for Johnny, man. I hope that somebody here gets that reference. Anybody? Uh, 
Um, there is another another design that we're dropping probably next week on that topic that uh, some of you Anjanu fans might enjoy. All right. Uh, so Johnny, I would say make sure that you subscribe to that newsletter because we'll definitely send out a notice when we have more of the super speed and then also the 3x. We'll, we'll mention that in the update. I think the newsletter sign up is right at the bottom of the page. All right, so 50 Sumalux. Okay, here's a kicker. There are five versions of the 50 millimeter Sumalux. So this is a perfect example of when someone e emails me and says, hey, I have a, a, a Leica R50 Sumalux. What filter thread or what step up ring do I need? I don't know. There's five different versions of that lens. <laughs> so this particular one, based on the serial number 3729, And it's an E55. Okay, that matches up. So this is this was produced between 1997 and 2000. Uh, seven elements, six groups. Iris blades. Oh shoot, I didn't get the blades on the 35. Six blades. See, that's the one of the big differences. The so this is the second to latest version of the 50 Sumalux. The latest version produced between 1998 and the end of the Leica R line um, has eight blades. Oh, Johnny, we are doing the Kubrick lens, believe me. That's coming after the Ingenue, but don't tell anybody. I haven't, uh, I haven't finished that design yet. Do corporate videography and the work t-shirts are fine enough pattern that it causes it. Um, if you're getting tons of more, then you either have to change their shirts or uh, you know, maybe use a, a filter, like a soft effects or something to dumb it down. How can I storage my lens in the case without the cap? What? Lenses, you just want to keep them in a, a dry place for the most part. Uh, keep the caps on them. Um, temperature isn't too critical. You just don't want it to be any extreme, and you don't want it to fluctuate. All right, what else did I not get on this one? I have an empty field here for focus diameter. I, uh, I will release this database to everybody once I feel that it's complete enough, but I don't want to release it until then. Is it necessary to store them with the iris closed down? Um, I would say... So there's different scenarios there. Um, if you do have temperature fluctuations and the lubrication from the iris can loosen up and liquefy, it could end up getting onto the blades. And if the blades are closed, it's less likely that it'll get on there. 
but that still means that as soon as you do close them, they're going to come in contact. So I don't know that that's particularly relevant. Um, if you're talking about transporting them, then I would say keep the iris blades open. Uh, but I don't think there's an ideal answer to that, Steve. Sorry. Thanks for telling us about those Kim wipes. I cleaned my lenses when I got back and they do help a lot. Yeah, of course. Every, that's, that's like, uh, that's a staple of any lens technician. You, Kim wipes, you just go through hundreds of them a day. I do feel bad because it's a little bit of an environmental thing, but every single technician has a blue bin. I don't know if you can even see this, but that's where all the Kim wipes go. So they do technically get recycled. So hopefully we're, we're helping as much as we can environmentally because we do use a ton of Kim wipes. All right, so this particular is 3729. Okay, and this is a ROM, I believe. It's not. Oh, okay, my notes are inaccurate. See, this is why I have not released this database because I keep finding little things. This is a can. Okay, so this, how is that possible? does not compute. Do you still have that lens in your possession? 50 million planar? Yes, I do. Has it or can it make a cameo for the stream? <laughs> uh, I guess. I still feel like I'm I'm flexing too much when I do that. I'll grab it because this I need to do some more work on my um, my catalogs because this does not match up. These serial numbers don't match up for the cam and ROM system. Fifty one four. Fifty one point four. So this won't specify if it's a ROM system, which is kind of a bummer. But at the time this was published in 1999, 51.4, it's an E55, so that's a slight giveaway. The part that bothers me is every single Leica R has this number, has an order number. It's basically a model number. And it was on the boxes and it's what every dealer used when they wanted to order one, but they never used that number on the lens. So unless you have the box and you know that lens was in that box, um, the order number is useless. And it would be so helpful if they just put it on the lens. So, oh well. Point five. All right, that's correct. Yeah, this doesn't doesn't add up. Doesn't make sense. So I'm gonna have to either find a, a uh, whatever the previous range I need is, like a ninety six. Do you see any more of the lock, like a Noctilux 50? Uh, not really. I mean, we could put a front ring and we can do a focus gear, but we usually don't declick um, Leica M lenses. 
and sadly they never made an Octolux for the R system. Regarding Kim Wipes, do you ever use softer alternatives? Sometimes I feel like it can be rough. If it feels rough, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> uh, you should always, for lack of a better term, you should lubricate your Kim Wipe. There should be either acetone or methanol or some kind of cleaning fluid. If the Kim Wipe feels rough, it's because it's dry. So uh, that should solve your problem. I'm looking to get some 4x5 filters. What brand? Oh, geez. Any, any. You can't go wrong. Play with them all. Try them all. Uh, obviously, you're going to get better results with the higher priced, higher quality ones, but you can't go wrong with Tiffin, Schneider, uh, Format, High Tech. Uh, yeah, take your pick. Um, all right, I'll grab. Kubrick, but only for a second because I'm not trying to make it that kind of stream. BRB. Okay, so who was asking about that? I don't remember who asked. Do one with the Kubrick land. Oh. Do you still have, oh, is refresh. Or re Reef for 35H. It's, it always looks like refresh to me. Um, there it is. I have it mounted right now. Um, Carl Zeiss. 50 millimeter. F0.7. There you go. Um, I can't remember if there's film in here. I don't think there is. Um, I ran a roll through it uh, a couple weeks ago. And I, actually, you know what? I will load another roll. I really, really, really hope that there's no roll in here right now, but there's absolutely no way to tell. Actually, the counter would be reset. doesn't feel like I don't, there's no tension. There is no mount. The lens does not have a mount. No, there's nothing in there. I, there's no resistance whatsoever. Um, the fact that the lens doesn't have a mount is exactly why this is such a rare lens and why, I mean, a handful of people have ever shot with one of these. Okay, thank God there's no mount. No film. Um, this is the reason why it will never work on a digital camera. The distance from the rear element to the film plane is practically nothing. So let's toss a roll of good old cine still. Fifty D. Gotta have that low speed since it's a 0.7. There we 
There we go. Oh, you know what? Did I? Okay, that's correct. There we go. Locked and loaded. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward lens because it was designed for uh, a different system. There's your aperture control. Actually, I'll show you because I, I don't care about wasting that first frame. So it's 99% glass and really just a shell and a, a shutter system built right in the middle. So you can't, nothing moves because the shutter itself is closed. I don't know if this will show up on camera. Um, but let's try it. I just exposed it. So now it's cocked. And let's see if it actually shows up. I doubt you guys could see that. <laughs> it was extremely fast. But the shutter is right there. There's no shutter on the camera. There's nothing, there's no exposure tools on the camera whatsoever. There's not even a viewfinder. It is what it is. You just point and shoot, sadly. So. I'm still not to zero, so I'll do it again. Maybe you guys can see it. Let's see if you can see the... We could see... Oh, good. It's so fast. That is the shutter. I don't know that this is working correctly. I don't have, I haven't tested the actual shutter. Saw the shutter actually, okay, good, good, good. So I can open it manually and you can see the actual blades, which I think, yeah, I'm still not on zero, so it's fine. So there's the shutter, you can see it there. And there's the iris itself, which I can adjust. The smallest aperture, that's F8 and then that's 0 0.7. And then I can just close the shutter manually. So yeah, that's it. All right, enough show and tell. I'm gonna run this roll through it probably this weekend. Um, okay. It's been about an hour and the wind has not stopped, so I'm gonna call it there. And uh, maybe we'll pick up tomorrow. I don't know how Kubrick and his team do that. Oh my gosh, so much planning prior and they had the rack over system so um, if anybody has the opportunity to go to the Kubrick exhibit uh, I highly highly recommend it if you're in actually I don't know if it's still up that was a long time ago it's probably not up anymore but um, the the way they did it was it was essentially on a rack over I mean it was a rack over so they would put a basically a sample lens in place compose the shot, get everything lined up, and then swap it out for the, the Zeiss and hope that everything stayed lined up and is accurate. But the way I have it here, there is no viewfinder system. You can't look through the lens, period. Um, so you really just have to kind of guess what you're pointing it at, <laughs> sadly. Anyways. Um, yeah, I'm gonna call it here because the wind is just insane. So keep an eye on YouTube um, on our channel. I might try again tomorrow if the wind dies down. If not, then 
um, maybe next week or next weekend. But uh, just subscribe and that's, it sounds cheesy, I hate saying it, but that's how you'll know if I go on tomorrow, you'll get a notification. Um, so yeah, I will tidy up, which usually takes a couple minutes, but since I don't have stuff, it's gonna take me two seconds. going to go to service. All right. I will see you guys next weekend or tomorrow. Subscribe and you'll know.